What is up, everybody? This is Michael Zakond, and you are listening to Our Future Podcast. On today's episode, we have a 24-year-old and 25-year-old founder who are building the financial infrastructure for how EV charging gets done in America. Next up, we have a kid named Satya Subramanian. He's a young cat who's teamed up with his co-founders to build an AI platform for getting government contracts. We have a lot to talk about today. Me and Simi cover the hottest up-and-coming young founders who are going against Goliath. They're David with their slingshot. And we use this podcast to help them get discovered and to celebrate what the youth are up to. These youth are very smart these days. Dude, why does no one stand up for the little guy? Why do you think that is? We're the valiant, you know, <laughs> tech third of Gen Z entrepreneurship. So we, uh, we, we blast this stuff out, get people to notice these, these folks. I guess so. Look no further than uh, Mike and Simi, but I think there's no bigger, bigger Goliath than the U.S. government, which is why I'm stoked to talk about our first company today. So, uh, you know, the first story today, we have these three entrepreneurs. Their names are Sachin, Philip, and Andrew, and they are building a company called Sweet Spot. It's essentially a search engine for government contracts. And so Typically, the bidding process for government contracts has been super outdated. I mean, you're mm -hmm. going through pages on pages. It's really technical wording, and it's not exactly like easy to synthesize or comprehend. And so um, they've created an all-in-one solution to help you go find these opportunities and then actually go bid on them. And so the way it works is, you know, say I'm running a construction company and I'm looking for a government con a contract in my specific area. Um, I can set up these alerts. And so anytime a government contract comes up that hits those certain metrics or those features, it will essentially alert me. And I think there are a few other cool features a, a part of this too. You can use it to ask questions. And so instead of me having to read 50 pages, I can just be like, hey, does this government contract have X, Y, or Z things? Yes, I'll, I'll go bid on it. No, I'm not going to. Um, and then you can also manage your workflow in there as well. So say you're trying to bid on say several different government contracts in at the same time, it enables you to have the tools to do that as well. And so why I'm super excited about this, I don't know if there's a bigger industry out there than the government. Uh, last year, they awarded over $765 billion in government contracts, and it's single-handedly supporting some of our biggest industries between you know, defense, healthcare, and construction. So I'm excited to jam on it with you and get your thoughts. Dude, remember when we were uh, getting a demo of the platform with him and he was like, he's like, yeah, we were talking to the head of uh, like private prison and we were onboarding them to like help them <laughs> like build super max prisons. <laughs> and then he looked it up for us like on the platform and it was like the first thing that came up was like, yeah, like government requests, like seafood for inmates or it was like beef for inmates. And I was like, oh my God, like these opportunities are insane Sam.gov, which is the platform, the status quo uh, for finding government contracts, it's maintained and built by the government, as you know, right? Like the government is terrible technology, but the the search engine capabilities of that are very bad. So yeah. even if you like type in the right keywords, it still might not surface the right content in, in on the website. So that's what SweetSpot's doing a great job of is the the search engine capabilities and that it can really help you find the most relevant contracts and, and not let them slip through the cracks. Um, you know, a lot of these businesses are dependent on their next government contract, right? Being able to fulfill the next one if there was a duration on the last, right? There's businesses in this space, he was telling us, that specifically subcontract. So they have the specific, um, they have the specific uh, characteristics that will enable them to get the contract. For example, they're minority owned. I don't know. Your uh, uncle does, um, you've talked about him before, but he does government contracts, right? Yeah, he does. I mean, it's a, it's a really great space to play in, especially because there's just big dollar signs attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the big thing is like people don't really understand how to like, leverage those appropriately because there's a lot of like rules and stipulations that you have to follow in order to accurately bid on a contract. Right. And if you don't actually, um, you know, hit every single box that they have, I think your, your application or your bid essentially just gets discarded. Um, so there's a little bit of a learning curve in there. And then on top of that, it's also one of those spaces that I think that there are just high switching costs. So my hunch is, is that 
once you become, you know, uh, you, you win a few contracts for certain things, you probably become, you know, one of their, their go-to vendors in the future as well. And so, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's one of those things, like, it's just hard to get started because you just have to learn and you have to know the right people. But once you're in, like, it's a great place to play in and you can build a massive business around this. And so, yeah, I think government contracts, they cover everything under the sun. I mean, electric vehicles, like healthcare, um, prisons, like you name it. And, you know, it makes me think too, like we have this buddy and he's definitely like one of the biggest like hustlers. I I would say we both know where he's just like always doing some scrappy feels like it's a little illegal, but he's making a lot of money doing it. And mm-hmm. he created a VR gaming studio that serviced prisons. And so <laughs> it's like one of those funny things yeah. where inside these prisons, these people have tablets and, you know, they can they essentially games. play games and yeah. he's servicing all of the games in there. And so I believe that was another one of those like government contracted related works that he was able to to bid and, and get approved. Now it was a bitch doing it. It took him a while, but I mean, he made millions. So it's, uh, it's funny. I, and I think it's cool. Yeah, man. I mean, if the prisoners can't be shooting shit up, like let him do it in VR, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um uh yeah that's that's just like a hilarious story i just saw a tiktok with a g-wagon it was driving through the traffic and its license plate was ppp loan <laughs> like uh you know th- this industry of government contracts is so weird it's like dumb people who are really smart i don't know how to describe it it's like people who are like street smart and then like People who are street smart and make money, I feel like government contracts is like the ultimate rep- representation of that idea, right? And that you don't have to be like a tech genius. Um, you probably like blue collar, you probably like work with machinery or some shit, but like you're able to get these fat racks because you just know how the system works. And that's what this um, kind of AI product is helping people do is I would think like, help businesses enter the space and create uh, a larger amount of entrance into like the government contracting space, because there's a few features I think that help an upstart. For example, one of the features reminds me of simplify that we talked about on like a, we talked about simplify in a past episode, yeah. but they do, they, they tailor your resume to each uh, job you apply to. And this reminds me of that because it also will tailor like your outreach um, or like your respond to proposal your like respond to rfp um and like present yourself in the best possible light so as to tick off every box that is on that pdf document that they've issued so it's funny you said simplify because i was thinking the same thing i was like you know this feels like simplify because it essentially optimizes your response so um, you know, you're essentially highlighting every single keyword in your application that the job description, or I guess the contract description would be. And I was like, this, there's probably an arbitrage opportunity here in the short term. You know, my hunch is, is that the government will probably catch on at some point and they'll probably, you know, there, there will probably be some kind of safety or, uh, security concerns around this. And they'll probably try to deter people using AI to to bid for government contracts. Like, I think if there's one place where they should be concerned, this is probably the space for that to happen. Uh, but b- until that happens, this is going to be great for people. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's one risk. I think another risk is, you know how like people have always tried to build like tech for lawyers and it's never worked. It's like one of those categories where like, they don't want to use new technology and they still use pen and paper and like read shit with like printed out. I feel like government contracting is similar. I don't know if you can convince like, uh, you know, family businesses in the roofing category or like, you know, defense, like, you know, gun trigger manufacturers to like use a platform like this. Um, so I think that's another risk is like, you know, tech adoption just isn't, uh, isn't, you know, tech isn't very penetrated in these kinds of businesses. So I think it would you know, be hard I to get people to I use don't it. Think that's as, I don't think that's as big of a risk because it's not like they're using AI or tech to go fulfill the work. It is just purely just, Hey, let us help you land more contracts and make more money. Um, mm-hmm. And I think if you were to make the same pitch to a lawyer, which was like, hey, all of these companies um, need legal work. And here are kind of like the stipulations or here's kind of how we got to the answer here. 
um, would you be interested in a service like this where we just alert you anytime someone needed uh, a job that fit this description? I bet there would be a lot of interest for that in the in the legal services industry. Yeah, it's a that's a really really great way to phrase it. It's not how the work is done; it's how the work is found. I think that's a great yeah. idea. Um, but also I think there's like this industry, like it makes sense to be like, if you know, you know, right. Like, um, not everybody can like, you know, cash in on government contracts. It's like, it's very, very specific processes. And it's like, if you know people and like the way these opportunities get discovered, probably not through the search engine more through like, Hey, but like, have you heard about this one? Have you seen this one? Maybe the government contacting folks directly, you know, they just want a good job done. They don't really want a hyper competitive marketplace, right? Um, because the government doesn't care about efficiency. It never has, right? It just wants work fulfilled. Um, so I don't know. You know, it brings up an interesting Maybe it's better. Point, Maybe it's, you know, yeah. I like like I just made a video on Craigslist and like the 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 moral of that story was like AI crypto, it's never gonna change the way you go and meet up with a guy and buy his old speaker system, right? Um some things are better left unchanged. So I'd be curious if that ethos applies to this. I don't know if it does. Maybe he can revolutionize it. And everybody uses this tool to to surface new opportunities. But that's like a an element here we can't ignore. Yeah. I mean, I think you bring up an interesting point, though, where, you know, who would use this service? Is it going to be the blue collar companies and firms um, and trying to to implement this and integrate it for them? Or is it going to be for the new tech companies that go raise a lot of money who are bidding for government contracts? Mm -hmm. um, and are yeah. they going to be the, the people to adopt it? Because those are two very different customer bases. And the way you have to get in front of them is also going to look a little different. Um, so my hunch is, is that, you know, in this context, maybe it's only it only really makes sense for like the tech companies who's try, who are trying to bid for them because they already have an understanding of how all this technology works. Um, so it's not yeah. as steep of a learning curve versus like, I don't know, your Martin Marietta's or your like Keystone constructions and like people who are just yeah. like very blue collar. For sure. I mean, you know, like there was that massive, uh, Jedi contract that Amazon and Microsoft like fought over. And, you know, obviously there's some American tech companies that do like DOD work and, you know, there's, there's probably like, that's probably a revenue stream. Uh, maybe we'll see VCs like saying, Hey guys, have you heard about sweet spot? You need like, if you can't find customers, just go to the government. Um, you know, what's another interesting like idea I had around this is like, what if you looked at it from, you know, a competitive angle, which was there, this is probably private information. So you may not know this until, um, you may not know this until the government contract has been awarded, but if there was a way to figure out like which one of your, what your competitors are bidding on could be also a really interesting signal where it was like, Hey, we know that three these three firms in your region um, or your city or town typically bid for contracts under these metrics. Like there's a way to detect that somehow. Um, and so this is just something you should keep in mind or we're going to try to source the same opportunities for you anytime it makes sense. Well, do you remember the scene in War Dogs where they go to the Pentagon and they completely absolutely shit the bed? They underbid by I think yeah, $100 million. Yeah. And they were yeah. so beat up about it, right? Uh, so yeah, I think competitive intelligence matters a lot in an auction style uh, system, right? Where, yeah, because you're competing for the same yeah. dollars, right? Like at the yeah. end of the day, it's just like only one or maybe, you know, one main, a few subcontractors are going to win a bid. And so it's very high stakes. They can't afford to lose too many of these deals if you're supported by government contracts. Yeah, dude, competitive intelligence is a great uh, business opportunity in this in this lane. Do you think there's an interesting services business around this? I I would. It made me think. You know, maybe I can't go start a blue collar you know company of some kind. I may not want to do the work, but there's probably an interesting you know uh, services business that a young person could go build off of this, which is go find blue collar businesses in your particular area or your state um, that tend to rely on government contracts or could greatly benefit from being involved in them. Um, and then also being like, like a lead generation agency of sorts. So mm -hmm. um, maybe they don't want to use sweet spot and they don't want to right. like learn right. it and like deal with it. But if someone else is willing to do the legwork and essentially like built up these reports for them that they got every week or sent to them over email, that could probably be a pretty big business. 
I agree with that. I think like just being a Sam.gov snake and just like being able to rip through all that content and like being able to surface, figure out and learn like what is a good deal and what's not. And like, what is a contract that makes sense for my client? Yes, I agree with you. They want to work with people and not software platforms. So, I mean, you just addressed that risk we talked about earlier. Uh, maybe this is an opportunity for young people to, to make, make some cash. Um, because look, for like, sure. I don't know. I don't care what you're building. We've just said this before. Um, you know, make sure it increases revenue. It increases deal size. It increases uh, leads coming in. I think that's like the highest leverage position you can be in in a business. Generating yeah, more I mean, because if you if you look at most of these agencies or consulting businesses today, they're usually focused around some kind of tech platform, right? Mm -hmm. So we know tons of people who have built, you know, like Salesforce, yeah, yeah, yeah HubSpot yeah. or yeah. Salesforce implementation, um, you know, consulting businesses that are doing millions of dollars a year, and it's literally just going into these companies and teaching them how to use these platforms, and so. There's probably, you know, uh, a big business to be built around this similar concept concept in this space where it's like, hey, you know, the way people are getting these government contracts is going to look very, very different and you don't want to be left behind. And so instead of you trying to learn it, how about I do it for you and you just pay me X amount a month or pay me X percentage of every contract that you win, um, which could be super lucrative depending on how big the contracts are. There'd be some fat bags. Dude, this all makes yeah. me think like um, AI, everybody's like, as people have AI products for every industry, people are constantly finding a new industry to apply AI to. This is a great example. AI for government contracts. Sounds great. Um, but also the more niche you get, just like the harder it's going to be to distribute an AI product to the people in that space, right? Everybody's like celebrating like go after build for blue collar businesses, build software for them. Like, I think the downside to this mentality that everyone's been having about going after boring businesses is the marketing and distribution challenge, right? How the fuck do you reach these business owners who rely on government contracts? A lot of them are ain't on as hell, even if they have a, you know, a 10, 50, hundred million dollar mansion, right? A lot of them are just very hard to figure out where they are and like, you know, if you know what they're even working on. Um, so I partially agree. I think it's way more challenging than just running a paid ad on LinkedIn or Facebook and getting a bunch of people. Um, but I, I do think that it's just a different kind of sales, right? So, you know, instead of just maybe cold outbound, you got to pick up the phone and you got to call them or you got to go door to door. Um, I think there's inherently, there's yeah. inherently way, it's a way less scalable marketing model. And I don't care even if you master it in some way, you're going to be doing more legwork than like a B2B. But the, the, there's a oh. bigger moat in that, right? Like that, that's sure. a, yeah. if, if you can somehow find a way to like unfragment that and, and get a lot of people, yeah, it's going to suck and you're going to like have to deal with a bunch of annoying stuff and it's, and it's going to take you longer, but that's a bigger business in my opinion. And that is probably going to sell for way higher multiples. For sure. Well, I mean, best of luck to Sachin. He was a like, animated guy i enjoyed hearing him talk and hopefully He's they can cool. uh crack a, a nut in this market yeah for sure hit us with story number two so our next story this company was founded by selene feliz parlak and furhat babakan they're both in their early 20s and they've raised over 7 million from investors like porsche and ford to build the american express for electric vehicle owners so Blue Dot, it describes itself as a banking and rewards platform for EV owners. In other words, they offer a debit card for people to pay for charging for their electric vehicle. So they have an app and they have this like physical card and it will work with around 60% of charging stations across the US. So they're already in a majority of locations. Um, and they've partnered with all these big charging companies like uh, Electrify America and ChargePoint. And they offer a standard flat fee rate if you're using their card. So in this case, it's uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour of charging with all the stations in their partner network. But here's what's also interesting. If the charging station is not in their partner network, they'll give you 20% cash back on the charge that you made with the, the station or whatever it was. They also give 5% uh, cash back on all automotive related expenses for your EV and 2% on all of their purchases. So they have like kind of a credit card model here in place. Um, there's a massive opportunity in the EV charging space. In 2022, 6% of EV uh, cars sold were EVs. 
Uh, that number only went up in 2023 and will also be the same for 2024. Uh, Biden signed in a $1.5 billion like per state inflation reduction act. So they'll have $1.5 billion to invest in uh, specifically EV charging stations. And since the biggest anxiety for a lot of buyers of EVs, mainly outside of the Tesla ecosystem is range anxiety, uh, Blue Dot is kind of becoming this app to lessen uh, that fear and that you know what the prices are going to be and you can use their app to identify like the nearest stations very easily. Um, there's a few cool parts to this business that I like. One of them is uh, proximity-based commerce. So uh, what they've rolled out in their app is a way to figure out what restaurants are near the charging station you're parked at. And then Blue Dot will offer uh, discounts or vouchers to those places, not only to drive local business, but to provide more value to the EV user while they're just sitting around idle while their EV is charging. Um, so yeah, uh, they've raised 7 million bucks. Um, you know, the best place to look to see if a product is good and useful, I think is Reddit. And I was looking through Reddit about seeing all these EV owners say they really enjoy the product. They enjoy the, uh, kind of flat rate fees and yeah, they've, they've clearly like gotten some good distribution and built a good product that's generated word of mouth in the, the EV space. So how big is the business? Uh, but there was, there's no data on like how many users they have. Uh, I would assume it's in the tens, tens, uh, of thousands, uh, right now, maybe in, maybe a little higher. I'm not sure, but I think that would be like a, a good place to put it. Are there any government subsidies in place? I mean, it's just kind of funny. This like aligns so well with the, the past story around government contracts. So blue dots bet is on the growth of the EV category. It's less yeah. on like government infrastructure or whatever. Like the fact that the government is pouring in money to support this trend is, is just great to, for them to be. Yeah, they with. go hand in hand. The, yeah, the government exactly. pouring money will grow the industry or at exactly. least it should. Right. Yeah. Until recently, they just had this news that I think a lot of the big automakers are kind of walking back on um, just how bullish they were on electric vehicles. It seems like adoption yeah. isn't quite as strong as what people were thinking it was going to be. Well, dude, Elon just crushed it. I mean, he made the infrastructure investments, um, you know, akin to AWS and Azure having all these physical like um, server net networks like around the world, like physical uh, he did the same with like just putting a Tesla supercharger, you know, along all these major routes. They're everywhere. And it's almost like, dude, imagine that you have an Android phone and uh, another guy is an iPhone and there's a lightning cable, like there's lightning cables all over the house, but there's like only one USB-C. So uh, it's very difficult um, for like, like non-EV, uh, non-Tesla companies to compete with like Tesla's charging network. Um, and that's why like apps like Blue Dot need to step in and provide the value to help people like discover these stations um, and help people uh, create kind of a, a, a standard when it comes to using different ones. For sure. I mean, I think the business is actually really smart, um, mm -hmm. especially because, again, high switching costs here. I think like if most if you're saying 60 percent of the electric vehicle um, charging stations are within coverage, right? Do you see this as like one of those things where maybe multiple options could be provided? Like how competitive is this landscape? Yeah, I don't think it's too competitive, right? Like there, I don't think there's any other company offering like a debit card specifically for EV charging stations. I would assume that some of the EV charging stations have their own like loyalty programs, perhaps. Like well, that's what I was thinking. Charge point. Yeah, right. Um, but maybe it makes more sense for them to distribute through a very, very consumerized player like Blue Dot, right? Which is yeah. working with all the stations, which you know, is doing the mapping, um, all that, all that jazz, this entire business is going to depend on, you know, penetration, like how many users can blue dot get using this platform, using their product, using their debit card on transactions. Right. Like, I think that's the, the big bet that they're making. Um, you know, their business model, I think is, uh, is tough. Um, you know, just doing like a debit card. And then I would assume, I don't know if they have to pay these charging stations to get these flat rates, if they're subsidizing that, right? Like it's a very like consumer business backed by VC that will like the business model is a bet on massive use. Uh, and that's like essentially what we're, we're going to have to see. Is well, I think the proximity thing is also super interesting, right? Because they can build a massive business just off of the mapping technology. I mean, that's, like that is literally the business model for like a ways, right? And they were, they yeah. were bought for a lot of money. Um, and I yeah, think because, that, yeah. yeah, knowing where someone is going is like the most valuable information you can have. 
Cause then yeah. you can surface, you can do paid ads around like, you know, where, what restaurant or gas station they end up going to. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because the EV community is so strong. Like people who drive Tesla's um, maybe it's less so now because it's, well, they're way cheaper than they've ever been. And they've become uh, they've kind of focused on like volume more than anything. Um, yeah. So they're, they're not quite as scarce, but people really rally behind like driving an electric vehicle. And so it makes sure. me wonder if there is like a community component in here where similar to ways people are kind of, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the moat and proprietary data around like um, getting users to actually generate activity within the, the mapping or something like that. I wonder, I wonder how they connect that, but that can make things interesting too. No, that'd be super interesting. Like uh, user reviews on certain chargers that might not be as fast. Um, Maybe exactly. a networking feature to allow you to meet like people at the charging station while you're waiting and just want to have a conversation. <laughs> uh, who needs match group when you can just go who, date? Your yeah. Who needs uh, match group when you can use hard. blue dots dating feature? Like I want to <laughs> look, I personally am looking for somebody who cares about the environment as well. Um, so <laughs> that could be funny. Um, so funny. But dude, the local commerce side is just like, I think that's really interesting too. Like being able to drive, being able to drive consumers into businesses that are near charging stations, I think is a, another huge uh, economic opportunity. Uh, yeah. Like that's, that's, that's powerful. Um, I was looking at one of these, these Reddit users and he was like, I think Blue Dot's going to go out of business once their VC funding dries up because he's like, there's no way that they can afford to be subsidizing these charging rates when they vary so much. Well, then they'll just change the model. Right. Like if it got they're probably not too concerned about the money side just right now. The they're probably just focusing on like, you know, a land grab strategy and just trying to get as many people right. and as much coverage as possible. And then like anything else, they'll probably hike up the rates or implement some kind of dynamic pricing of some kind or surge For pricing. Sure. Um yeah, <laughs> which is like, unfortunate, um, but usually how this works. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Like um, you know, the way Tesla started is like any new car you bought, you had unlimited charging or like unlimited charging yeah. for like 30,000 miles. Until you um, don't. Now, now yeah. you have to pay for all, like all your charging. Right. So it's like the earlier you are usually the better in these spaces before there's massive penetration distribution in a certain market. Uh, you can just give people better deals, right? Like these charging stations are great customers to work with. Yeah. It's yeah. a hilarious flywheel yeah. where it is like a new, you know, a new company like this comes in they offer great deals to everybody. It's almost too good to be true. Then the model starts to break. Um, they've, you know, essentially teased everybody and got them to be a user. And then, you know, they become kind of the incumbent in the space. And then some new upstart company will come out and be like, hey, remember when Blue Dot was so great? Well, now they suck. And we're yeah. here to disrupt them, right? And it's like a never-ending cycle where it's like yeah. they, just, they just keep replacing the guy in front of them. And some new person will come in with slightly better rates and slightly better perks to go disrupt the guy before him. Yeah, that's what the beauty of capitalism, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, they could. this could be you know very, very big business. You know, these charging stations are good businesses to work with. Uh, typically their usage rate is at like six to 8%. Uh, if you look at a gas station, right? Like their usage percentage, like the, the, the amount of time there's at least one car at a gas station is, is very high, right? It's much higher than six to 8%. So having a lot of consumers and being able to drive traffic and awareness to specific chargers is a super valuable marketing activity as well. So Blue Dot is like, it's, it's a marketing company above all else, right? Like they're pushing users, they're selling users to charging stations, and then they're selling those users to businesses locally. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a definitely a, a really smart model. And, um, you know, again, the EV community is a great customer to go after because they all like talk amongst each other about their experience owning EVs. Um, and they're always trying to help each other out about like how to be more efficient or like what, Oh, you, you heard about this new charger, like over here, like they, they talk, like I know people with EVs. So I, and I, I think like you hinted on it, this will be a big advertising business for sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah. um, it's a, it, not exactly a great parallel, but like Lyft and Uber, look how big those businesses just are on, on the, on the backs of big advertisers, right? Like, um, most of these companies, it actually makes more sense 
to for them to advertise through like something like this where you have a lot of first party data um and you can kind of influence their decisions versus like going to say you know a traditional media company or print um or some of the the traditional advertising channels well dude also just think about the demographics of an ev owner they're wealthier yeah, that's what i was thinking um, they're wet yeah. they're coastal um they are uh you know environmentally conscious Yep. Uh, they're a great advert. They're great to be advertised to and great to upsell. So there was an another company actually called Volta, which Shell acquired. Uh, I think Shell acquired them or invested in them. Might have been invested in them, and they run ads on EV chargers. So the shtick behind their EV charger is obviously you can charge a car, but there's massive screens, almost like billboards, that are like playing ads for like Disney World or like playing ads for Marriott so smart. and yeah. uh, apparently that business has been super successful, right? Like uh, I creating believe it. Uh, ads yeah. to, to these wealthy EV owners. Yeah. Dude, it's like the same it's models big. that have already existed, just applying them to a new space, man. They like if that whole uh, not needing to reinvent the, the, the wheel is like so true here. I will say though, I wish there was like a, a product like this for getting gas like you could just get like a flat rate for for gas as opposed to this shit <laughs> fucking swinging wildly up down left and right that'd be awesome why is so nobody funny. built an app like, why does nobody build a card like that hey like electric vehicles have been disruptive can someone go back to oil and gas and yeah go <laughs> yeah <gas>? yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like they've been around for hundreds of years but yeah i think i think someone needs to go get them so funny I've, I've, I wanted to tell you about this other girl who's building a card for um, fueling purposes. Uh, so we've, we wanted to cover her on like an original pod episode, but I'll just give a short story here for like an Instagram click clip. Um, so um, her name is Harshita Aurora. She's 22 and she's behind this trucking finance startup called A to B. And it's raised over 200 million in venture capital to be the go-to financial infrastructure for trucking. And the way they started is with a fuel card. So it's a card that trucking companies will give to their drivers to pay for gas, but only gas. Here's what's really interesting. What they found was there's a lot of theft that occurs with truckers and their trucking companies and that truckers will spend their fuel card on things that aren't fuel. And there was not a lot of tooling and uh, fraud prevention that was in place with those legacy fuel cards. And it was a big problem. Um, there are case studies on this company's website wherein trucking companies said they, they were saving 5 to 10% in expenses or, or in costs by reducing this particular behavior of using your fuel card on like buying like a, you know, beef jerky and snacks. Um, but refueling is just tricky across the board. Um, you know, like uh, the pricing and like knowing which stations you can go to where there's like preferred rewards. Um so yeah, they've they've built like a pretty big business. They have twenty four thousand uh, trucking companies. Like it's I don't know how they wow. got this many, but they have twenty four thousand customers using the app for fuel purchasing. But then they've expanded into payroll taxes and accounting. So they used the card as like a wedge. It's still their hero yeah. product, but then they're expanding into like Stripe for the trucking industry. Um, so yeah that I thought that was another interesting story. like you want to go back to oil and gas? That's a great example. like build a card for purchasing fuel for these fleets, and then it brings me back to Blue dot because they're also trying to focus on e v fleets uh so as xfinity trucks and as uh fire and alarm system fleets get updated to be e v s like they'll also be able to use this from a b two b perspective. That'll be cool, man, and then yeah, it's like there's probably extensions from there um it's like everyone's going after cars, then they go trucks, then ships and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, yeah. man, I think, th I think this was a lot of fun. Uh, any kind of closing notes or, or things you want to hit on? Yeah. Uh, just follow the money with the government, I guess. That seems <laughs> <to be the laughs> theme. <laughs> it's all yeah. out there. You just got to go get it. <laughs> it's all out there. Uncle Sam's got them deep pockets. Tax days yeah. in a week. He's going to have you flush. Uh, <laughs> so go and get your back. That's what the, what the, what the, uh, that's what the, that's what the, uh, takeaway is guys. All right. And on that, we're going to wrap. Thank you all for tuning into another episode of our future podcast. As always, give us a, give us a rating, give us some feedback wherever you listen to this and subscribe as well. 
In the meantime, hope you all have a great week and we will catch you again next week with another episode of Our Future Podcast. Stay frosty.